Hey everyone, Reese, Corey, and Jordan here with RI3 Cranberry Alarm. Today we're going to be talking about our strategy and we're going to be breaking down everything to the decisions that we made. We're going to be talking about the RPs, we're going to be talking about auto and how that affects your entire mass strategy and talking about um, how many balls you can hold in, into a single hopper that may be approachable um, and how that affects your entire um, outcome of your match. Coming up on Fun Robotics Network. This video on fun is brought to you by our viewers, supporters, members, and also in partnership with the following. Anymark is your one-stop shop for all things in FRC Rebuilt. Be sure to stock up on your Rebuilt game-specific elements right now at Anymark.com. Plus, check out the newly released products to help your team, and don't forget to stock up on bumper materials and kits. Head on over to Anymark.com to get the superior service and reliability that teams expect. Oshcut is a premier metal cutting service for first teams. No minimum order, options for same day turnaround, guaranteed lead times, and instant online quotes. Oshcut is offering first teams 50% off any future order up to $200 when you scan the QR code or go to funroboticsnetwork.com slash OSHCUT. Just upload a 3D model or flat pattern to get started. Yeah, so I think different than previous years, there's only a few tasks that a robot's going to have to do this year. Um, obviously, shooting, storing, passing, herding, collecting the fuel, all related to the fuel. And then the only other task this year is climbing. So um, speaking of that, there are two categories for RP. There's a fuel RP and a climbing RP. We have an energize RP, which is 100 fuel scored into the goal, and supercharge RP is 360 fuel scored into the goal. Um, the climb RP is a bit more difficult. There's three tiers of climbing, L1, L2, L3. L1 uh, is unique this year in that you are able to do it in auto to gain points towards this climbing RP. Um, if you do it in auto, it's 15 points. If you do it in teleop, it's 10. You're trying to get to 50 points by the end of the match. So um, if two robots climb L1 in auto and then do the same thing at the end of teleop, that gets you your 50 points. So um, the, we'll talk a little bit more later, maybe about the breakdown of what you would ro want your robot to do, but that uh, sums up the RPs. Yeah, awesome. And so this kind of, we broke down a little bit more of the key constraints, um, 110 frame parameter, 30 inch max height with no vertical extension. You can do side extension at 12 inches, but you can only do that out of one side. Uh, and your total robot weight can, is only 115 pounds. Uh, a couple key considerations that we made going into when it came into our strategy is talking about um, a large hopper versus the trench. Um, if we pan over to this robot right here, um, this is our test chassis that we got going on right here, and we basically put together a uh, pizza box uh, hopper, um, very robust. Um, but yeah, this hopper right here can hold 47 balls. Um, and this is uh, this line right here indicates the 21 inch mark. We chose 21 inches because the trench is at 22, so we chose an inch below that would be good uh, for basically considering a limit to how many balls we can uh, hold. And um, one thing to point out about this hopper is that it is extended outside of the frame by uh, a good 10 inches. So um, if you were to chop off the hopper at the actual frame of the robot, you can probably hold um, a third less balls, maybe. Yeah. A little bit more than that, but this is 50 balls right now. So as far as the storage capacity of the robot, which height you choose between the max height, 30 inches, and going under the, um, the bar, It'll it'll affect how many fuel you can hold. Right. Yeah. And and if you could if you weren't going if you made a robot that can't go into the trench and you decided to go for the 30 inch max height you get basically um, nine more inches of capacity to try and store that could be two more layers of balls depending on how they're nested um, that could and you can see how many are just layered here on just one layer um, you should be able to hold a considerable amount. But it all comes down to how fast you can alleviate those balls. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about our uh, priority list and stuff like that. But when it comes to how many balls you can hold, it comes to down to how many you can score. Um, and that comes down to your active and inactive periods. Um, and that's really where a lot of the sauce is going to be in this game. Um, it's going to be determining when you're scoring and what you're doing when you're not scoring. Um, and this is a big impact for auto. Um, when you uh, come out of auto, whoever is winning auto um, immediately goes into uh, teleop. Uh, you have that 10, trans uh, 10 second transitional shift um, where everyone is, has active, but then right after that, one person is inactive and one person is active. The team that is active is the team that lost auto. So you didn't have to go from scoring as many balls as you can in auto, 
or storing as many as you can on auto and then scoring directly in your first interval. Now we kind of came to the conclusion that during that time if you're trying to score, win auto and scoring as many points as you can, there's going to be no more fuel kind of around you or there's going to be a limited amount at least around you. Uh, and so therefore being an inactive for that first interval is proactive because that allows you to have time to set yourself up for the next active period. Now, whatever that strategy means for your team um, is what it, you know, whatever you guys want. Um, but we believe that this will be a good time to either bring balls to our side or potentially just fill up our hopper. I'll go ahead and pass it off to you, Corey, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, just adding on to that, I think one strategy that we'll see, rather than just collecting and moving them to the side, your side of the field, you can shoot fuel from anywhere on the field to anywhere else, as long as you don't score it from um, not your side of the, your third of the field. So the the strategy of passing from the center or opponent's side of the field to your side is is valid mm -hmm. and one that we were considering a little bit. But we'll talk about climb. Yeah. Uh, when it comes down to climb, um, with it being very interesting that you can do climb two times in a comp in a match, you can do it during auto and during tele up. With that said, your goal is uh, 50 points. So if you have only two robots on your alliance that can climb, um, you can actually get it through only L1s. Um, you basically need both robots to do auto L1, and that'll get you 30 points. And then you need both robots to then do your teleop, and that'll get you another 20 points to get you to the 50. Um, which is a neat point because the easiest climb, easiest finger, uh, finger quotes, um, can get you uh, the RP, which is a really big thing. Um, so yeah, anything you guys want to add on defense? No. So, yeah, we can talk about defense a little bit. Uh, I think there's a couple unique types of defense. Jordan, do you want to talk about that? Sure, yeah. So we're talking about, um, interestingly, there's no really, there's no protected zones where you can you can go in and, like, not have bumper-to-bumper -bumper contact. So uh, one of the trade-offs we were talking about is um, can you go to a known location to shoot, be that right in front of the hub in kind of, like, the the batter's position or like back against the tower, somewhere you can kind of index yourself in a known location and go, that might help you from robot to robot defense. Um, but then the other kind of defense we were talking about um, is if there is passing, one of the things you can do is basically counterplay passing. You can be in their third and you can just be gobbling up a bunch of balls and passing them all either all the way across the field to your section or even just straight back to the middle. Um, you know. It, if, if their best shooter doesn't have a large hopper and they have to kind of actively take the balls in as they're in that active period, that could be a, a pretty big hamper to their strategy. Yeah. Yeah, so I think a big thing with this year um, is that I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the meta plays out. You know, some teams are going to be able to predict right from the get-go how it's going to work with the inactive and active periods. But I think most of all, I think the uh, most important skill that any team should have is going to be flexibility when it comes to strategies. Um, you're going to work with different alliance partners that are going to want different things. Uh, so that's why we kind of want a robot that can play potentially different strategies and um, be better at different things and whatnot. Um, so we'll go ahead and get into our priority list, and this kind of breaks down our must-have, should-have, and won't-have list. Um, for our must-have list, uh, we know we want to drive. Driving is by far the most important thing you can do a match, and you should be doing that every match. Um, we want a ground intake. A ground intake is, an, in our opinion, an absolute must-have because every game piece uh, is going to be on the ground except for the ones that are in the shoot, which they have the possibility to end up on the ground anyway. Uh, and the game pieces will kind of continually cycle throughout uh, the goals and onto the ground, so that's a very big must-have. We want to hold as many fuel as possible. Um, and we want to be able to intake that in about eight seconds. So our goal is to be able to um, collect all the game pieces that we can in eight seconds. And the reason this is derived to eight seconds is because we know that um, during an active period, if we go into the assumption that you, prepare, you were working an inactive period to prepare your uh, full hopper, you then need to spend the next active period in three phases. Your first phase is going to be clearing out your hopper that you just collected uh, in your inactive period. Your next, period you uh, your next phase is going to be refilling your hopper. And your third phase is going to be emptying your hopper and scoring that a second time. Uh, and so that, our, that was derived from our original goal, which was to be able to score um, two full hopper uh, amounts of balls in, in one active period. Uh, I'm going to go pass off to Corey and you can keep, take it away. Yeah, one more thing to, to mention with hold as many fuel as possible. Kind of what we mean by that 
um, it's easy to just point at a robot or an implementation of that idea. The hopper versus like single line pass through mechanism, um, we don't really see a benefit in having a, or a benefit in not having a hopper. We think that it's going to be necessary for just this game and how the flow is, and if you want to be flexible in your role on your alliance to have a hopper. So if you have empty space on your robot, it's probably going to be filled with fuel. Mm -hmm. um, we think that that's pretty necessary. Uh, one of our, our next must have that we have on the list is to be able to shoot from the batter. And from the batter we mean um, right under the climb bars, which is a good point to reference yourself to. The hub, right up against the hub. Oh, right up against the hub, sorry. So yeah, tower, batter. <laughs> Still getting used to the names. Um, if you're able to shoot right up against the, the hub, then you're going to be able to index yourself. If a robot's hitting you, they're not going to be changing your angle very much. It's not gonna impact your shots. Um, it's going to give you consistency in, in how many fuel you actually score when you go to score. And then same sort of deal, um, we want to be able to shoot from the tower as well, which is um, in, still in line with the hub, but it's going to be where you climb. So the, the inherent um, like mechanism assumption that this makes is that we're able to shoot from different distances. So one of the things we said is uh, we want to be able to shoot right up against the hub and up to 12 feet away. Yeah. And on top of that, after that, we want to have an active L1 climber. Um, so this was talked about a bit because, you know, you can get L1 via a passive climber on your robot by driving through the middle. Um, however, by need of one, being able to do it in auto, and two, being able to do it with a partner, you can't take up the middle to do it with a partner unless someone has some crazy climber that we haven't thought of yet. I think it's a good assumption to say that if you want to climb with a partner, you need to share the bar, which means you need to bias yourself to the left or right side. Um, and then we also want to be able to do it in auto. And to do it in auto, that means that we need to be able to climb onto it and then get off of it. Uh, and so with the passive, you're kind of just on it and stuck on it. So we want an active L1 climber so that we can get on it and then get off of it. We uh, must have is 100% shooter accuracy. We'll see how this one works out. Uh, we're never going to miss a ball in the entire history of our robot. It'll never miss one ball. Um, likely we'll probably miss plenty. Um, yeah, we want a um, trench plus extendable hopper. And so extendable hopper means a um, horizontally extendable hopper. You can see here with this robot, we have the hopper extending outside of our frame perimeter. Um, and that can be done via our intake going out and kind of making that whole space a little bit larger. Um, but not a vertically extending hopper. Our goal with the trench bot, um, is we're going to be a trench bot. Um, we're going to be staying, our, our starting configuration height is going to be 21 inches, and we will never go over 21 inches. Um, that way we don't damage our robot going through the trench or whatnot. Um, one more comment about the shooter accuracy. We did have a long discussion about if it's lower than like 95% and you are at a fixed spot, um, from the batter or the tower, then you're really wasting, wasting potential. Like the amount of time it took for you to collect all of the fuel, go to your fixed spot and then shoot, you better be pretty dang accurate or it's not worth it. Um, the the trade-off or decision would be if you're going to shoot on the move or be intaking while shooting, you can be less accurate because you're doing both tasks at the same time. But if you're gonna park and you're gonna shoot, we got to be accurate. Yeah. And for our should have list, um, we wanted to be able to shoot from anywhere in the Alliance zone. Um, that would basically be from the darkest corners of the Alliance zone um, all the way up to the close of it. Um, this is a should have because our must have kind of controls most of the Alliance zone. Um, this would get us the last uh, outliers. And we want to be able to pass from all zones. This basically means be able to pick up game pieces um, and be able to shoot them from other zones into our Alliance zone. Um, L3 climb, we didn't include LT, L2 climb, it's on the won't have, um, because there's no point in building just an L2 climber, um, because the going from L1 to L2 should be about the same as going from L2 to L3, so therefore you should only be considering an L1 climber or an L3 climber. Uh, another should have was a turret. 
Um, this will be something that we evaluate a little bit more as we kind of get into uh, making the shape of the robot and how the robot plays out. Um, that will basically be for more automation when it comes to just positioning your robot and just getting really fast scoring. Um, active hood, this is pretty closely in line with the shoot from batter and shoot from tower objectives. So we'll see how that one plays out. Uh, from what we've seen, there's a good amount of positions that you can get from a static hood. However, the active hood gives you uh, so much more flexibility and will probably help you get closer to the 100% shooter accuracy. Uh, and lastly, we wanted to uh, eject with the intake and that would basically be all the balls that we intake, we can push that back out of our intake. Uh, and on our won't have list, we had double passing. This was just a joke we had, which is basically going from passing from one zone to the neutral zone and the neutral zone to the alliance zone. But that won't ever happen. From uh, one robot to another. Yeah, so along with um, the eject from the intake, um, we both theorized um, if your shooter breaks or if you're not super consistent with your shooter, one of the advantages of being able to get the balls out of your hopper is that we think you know everyone's going to have a ground intake. So if you can get the balls basically backwards through the system, you can park next to somebody that is very good at shooting. And at worst case, you can spend your time going and collecting a bunch of balls and then come back and feed them kind of right to your partner. So you're not uh, dead weight. You know, shooters break and things like that happen. And um, you you still want to be able to contribute. That's it's kind of a big thing that you could potentially still contribute in the match versus kind of classically, if, you know, if your shooter breaks, then you're just like, I'm going to go play defense now. Um, so we think that's a, like, another good way to, like, reasonably, meaningfully contribute still to your alliance scoring um, without having to just play strict defense. You know, a lot of teams don't necessarily even plan to be playing defense. So that is one thing to consider is just, like, training your drivers and such, where if, like, if for some reason things go wrong and you just have your drivetrain, like what do you do? How do you play robot on robot defense? Are there choke points that you can help block, right? Things like that, just things to consider. Well, that about does it for our comprehensive strategy for RA3D. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can play this game um, when it comes to just feeding robots or collecting a whole bunch of balls and then going and scoring them. The inactive and active sides of the game is going to be very, very interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, we don't know for sure if this is going to be the right way to play this game, but this is going to be the way that we're going to try and build a robot around it. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been our strategy overview for Cranberry Alarm RA3D. We'll catch you guys later. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Oshkut is a premier metal cutting service for first teams. No minimum order, options for same day turnaround, guaranteed lead times, and instant online quotes. Oshkut is offering first teams 50% off any future order up to $200 when you scan the QR code or go to funroboticsnetwork.com slash OSHCUT. Just upload a 3D model or flat pattern to get started. Animark is your one-stop shop for all things in FRC Rebuilt. Be sure to stock up on your Rebuilt game-specific elements right now at Animark.com. Plus, check out the newly released products to help your team, and don't forget to stock up on bumper materials and kits. Head on over to Animark.com to get the superior service and reliability that teams expect.